Zdravím vás, milí štvrtáci, vítam vás na poslednej hodine k 19. storočiu. A toto je hodina, ktorú zavesím aj na YouTube, takže prepnem naspäť do angličtiny, no a, a pôjdeme ďalej. OK, lads and girls, uh, this is another, another lesson from uh, our history classes and the fourth grade of uh, secondary uh, grammar school, gymnázium Andrea Kmetia in Báska Štiaňce, Slovakia. So this is uh, actually the last part of the uh, of the big topic of the 19th century, which means that for the uh, for this week, you know, that after the school, uh, either on Thursday or Friday, we are writing the test. Uh, so get ready, study hard, and I wish you good luck for that, because it will be, it shall be a massacre. Uh, the last part, which will be in the test, is this topic, the Balkans in the 19th century. So let's start from the, let's start from the beginning. Uh, Okay, so uh, what to say about this topic, because we mentioned it a couple of times only as a side topic and we haven't talked uh, a lot about this. Uh, of course, the Balkan Peninsula has always been ethnically uh, a diverse territory, which means that uh, due to the mountains uh, around and uh, hilly terrain, it was pretty, not easy, but it was easier for many tribes and states uh, to keep their independence and their specific features, which were, which were different and differences. And it concerns not only ethnically, but also in religion or in traditions and are also attitudes. So, uh, since the ancient times it was inhabited by Greeks, then by Dacians, uh, later becoming Romanians, uh, where are Slavic uh, nations and tribes, and uh, Albanians, uh, who supposed to be Illyrians, despite new discoveries, new uh, later uh, ethno-linguistic, geographic uh, uh, studies prove that probably it's not so easy to set and it's maybe uh, not a false but maybe like uh, incorrect way how to uh, accept it and in the Middle Ages in the in the high and late Middle Ages these territories were settled by Turks and influenced by Ottoman history which will we deal with a lot with Ottoman Turks and this is also the the thing we need to we need to know after this of course despite we are talking about the 19th century since we haven't talked a lot about this uh, this topic I will go back just like the case of Russia or Germany I will go back to even medieval times and especially early modern period so this is also the point when we have a milestone of the end of medieval times and the beginning of early modern period which is the fall of Constantinople as the last ten the last fort of the Byzantine Empire of course it was occupied by Ottoman Turkish Empire Ottoman Turks uh, which means that uh, Turks took over many of uh, uh, of the traditions and not only territories but also the administration of Byzantines. This was actually other thing that made conflicts or um, Byzantines had had conflicts already in the Middle Ages with the various Balkan nations but now it's changing this situation is changing. What happened? Uh, between 17th and 18th century the Habsburg monarchy uh, gradually banished uh, Turks from Central Europe and from south of the Danube and of course they still were leading many wars uh, against them. Actually not so as successful at, at the, uh, at the uh, at the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, and for that reason, uh, Habsburgs, Austria, somehow uh, gave up uh, the ambitions to uh, interfere in the Balkans, which was replaced for a while by Russian Tsardom or the Russian Empire, and actually it is bringing new conflicts in here. Uh, as you see, 19th century is not only about all these terms we had at the beginning from like political isms, like from nationalism, liberalism to emancipation, education, healthcare development, industrial revolution, but also a lot of wars around in here. So now Russia started to interfere and Balkan conflicts actually attracted also the attention of other European colonial powers, because as you realize at the previous lesson about Russia, Russians really started to grow in the early modern period and became really dangerous phenomena for let's say British interests uh, or French interests also in this part. So that's why we'll also um, uh, mention again some of these conflicts between Russians and Turks, Ottoman Turks. Actually all nations uh, 
under the occupation of Turks in the 19th century revolted and they were fighting for the independence of their nations. So it's more or less successfully, but before the First World War, it happened that from uh, these like ethnic groups we have in here, already in like beginning of uh, the 19th century, turned out to be the countries uh, just before the Balkan Wars of Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, but even Montenegro, Albania and Romania in here. Um, okay, so this is kind of revision for the maps. Uh, the sources I'm using is Historical Atlas of East Central Europe by Robert Paul Magocci from 1991. And it was really useful uh, source of information and maps for me. So as you see that from like 16th century Ottoman Empire already in our Slovakia, uh, was pushed back to the Balkans, but as you see, vast majority of all the Balkan Peninsula was a dominant part of the Ottoman Empire. You probably cannot see it when I uh, click the tabulator uh, in which I uh, erase this uh, my picture. Probably, so you cannot see this, but I'm sorry for that. I believe that you can use it for it on. So let's start from the with the first country that came in here, and that was Greece. Of course, uh, Greeks were a really famous country. Nobody needed to introduce them. And in 19th century, they were after many years of Ottoman occupation. This tradition, ancient Greek uh, education of culture of the Iliad and Odyssey, of mythology, of Greek-Persian wars and Athenian democracy and uh, architecture and sculpture and uh, playwrights. So it all was actually basic of European education and knowledge of 19th century. And uh, that means that means that just like them, the ancient Greeks, also Byzantine Empire was well known. And for that reason, uh, they had support from Western Europe. This was antiquity. The uh, Byzantine Empire actually introduced uh, introduced Orthodox faith, which is this Pravoslavia, well known for Russians. And of course, while it was settled in here in the Balkans with Bulgarians, Serbians, Montenegrins, for example, uh, using Cyrillic alphabet uh, and also tradition of Cyril and Methodius missions from the 9th century, and especially their uh, apprentices who were living in, uh, for example, in a monastery at uh, Lake Ohrid on the borders of Albania and Macedonia and spreading this Cyrillic alphabet, this first form of Cyrillic alphabet developed from Glagolica. Uh, so it was actually something that uh, definitely gave support for them from Russia. And that was case also of Greeks because they were the founders of Orthodox uh, religion, Orthodox uh, uh, Christianity. Uh, when I started so soon enough after the Congress of Vienna, which had no interest, no solutions for the Balkan Peninsula, and that's why Greeks started to fight in many like really celebrational paintings from this period where Greeks are wearing typical, uh, maybe for these days, ridiculous folklore costumes. But they swear it, uh, that was the fashion at the time. In uh, 1821, big uprising started in Greece. And it was actually very bloody, and uh, that for the moment the support started from, actually not from France so much. At the at the at the beginning, France was against it. If you remember, it was before uh, before this uh, July Revolution, where France was still like a good member of Holy Alliance. But most of the French public was supporting Greeks. The same thing was in the United Kingdom. In this case, policy, political politicians were more like divided in here. Actually, people were really like uh, supporting uh, Greeks. Among them, the probably most famous was a uh, famous romantic poet George Gordon Byron, as uh, he, after writing a couple of books, he decided to travel to Greece and to help. Uh, help uh, Greeks in this war of independence in person. And in this famous painting is in a uh, Greek traditional folklore costume. You see, it doesn't look very much like Greek, uh, that uh, if you remember, and it most like Balkans and this oriental part. So yes, Greece, Greece had changed a lot in here. Nevertheless, uh, it was successful or not, or they had or didn't have support. Greeks proclaimed so-called the First Hellenic Republic, Prava Hellenska Republika, which is another name for Greeks, as you know, in 1822. Actually, it was suppressed, and uh, Turks uh, claimed, the Ottomans claimed that uh, that was... Uh, 
That was because Greeks were also very radical, and that is also true that Greeks and they fought for independence were actually persecuting, oppressing Turks, and there were a couple of massacres happening near, which of course brought another revenge, and Turks started to do massacres on civilians. And this famous painting of Jean de la Croix, for us a really well-known painter of these revolutions of this period, uh, that he couldn't see actually, but as a secondary historical source, he wrote the depiction of the massacre on the island of Chios, which was one of the most infamous in this and this war. Of course, violence produces another violence, and of course, in this 1822, uh, it's uh, it also was one of the things that changed the will of politicians in the West whether to support or didn't support Greeks. So what happened already at the siege of Misolonghi in 1825-26 that was uh, described by many journalists and many writers of those times uh, actually caused that uh, Britain and France decided to support Greeks and for their support they decided to send uh, actually flee their military ships uh, for their support together with uh, Russian uh, Russian fleet and you don't have you can't see the picture because my face is in here but when you google for this the battle of Navarino uh, was a big battle in which uh, this uh, allied uh, British French and Russian fleet in 1827 defeated Ottoman fleet and thus supported Greek attempts for independence, which was actually came to be in 1832, uh, with the independent Kingdom of Greece was proclaimed, and now this time with the support of France and various other countries. And at the time there was a tradition, actually Greeks started, not they didn't start with this, but Belgians started with this, that uh, they were looking for the king, if they couldn't find a king who would be the heir to any of the noble families uh, or maybe houses ruling in those kingdoms, those monarchies. So they just look around and look for a big important families with various family connections to various kingdoms in order to have uh, a king who would have like friendly and allied relation with many countries. For that reason, another country, that, uh, not this family, was found again in Sveti Anton here in Slovakia with Saxon Gotta Coburg family or Kohari family also in here and also Otto of Bavaria was one of the members of this family who was also spending some summer sometime in this mansion in Sveti Anton. Just like Leopold King Leopold I and Leopold II of Belgium that we have mentioned before. And now this is the map of how it was produced. So, uh, King of Greece of 1832 with this like Greek cross flag, but also only with Peloponnese uh, Peninsula and Attica, with a couple of islands, including uh, Euboia. Uh, and gradually it was slowly gathering more and more territories in many wars that was led in here. So, for example, Britain, a uh, city like Rhodos, for example, then Ottomans took over some of the islands in Thessaly from Greeks again. And then, especially in the uh, Balkan Wars, Greeks managed to claim uh, Macedonia with Chalkidiki and Thessaloniki as the second biggest town in uh, in Greece, and also the island of Creed. And then what followed after more territories were claimed by uh, Greeks uh, after the First World War from Bulgaria, which they had lost later on, and also some parts of what is even nowadays Turkey of in Asia Minor around Smyrna. You know that there were many Greek ancient towns of these great philosophers and culture, but at the time still about 2 million Greeks were living at least in Asia Minor, including in the uh, East Trace, which is the uh, territories around Drin uh, Edirne or Drinopol. Actually, these were not uh, given to Greeks. What they managed to seize were all the islands, despite uh, uh, taken over by Britain or Italy. So this is how Greece uh, came to be in 1947. Okay, that was really brief view, overview of Greek history. Let's move to another Balkan country that is actually partially in the Balkans, a large part in, in Eastern Europe and some part even in Central Europe, and that is Romania. Uh, I was asking my friends from Romania how to proclaim, how to read this, uh, Ro Ro Romania, Romania, that should be something to A and E, eh? and, but also not Romania, but Romania. The reason is that these people later uh, claimed the heritage after the Romans. Actually, Indo-Europeans living in these territories were ancient tribes from maybe Iron Age period, and Romans called them Dacians, who were living especially in this la in this uh, small smaller part of uh, so-called uh, Transylvanian basin, and uh, this was 
actually conquered by uh, Romans after the rule of King Burebista in ancient times. Uh, well known for us because, for example, he was the king who actually decimated peoples in southern Slovakia. Look at them, their empire claimed to southern and eastern Slovakia too. But, you know, as your great warrior against Romans, so Romans, when they defeated these guys, uh, so usually they had this Pax Romana, which means killing their male population and uh, assimilating the rest of the population with females, so they were Romanized, and the influence of these Romans were so strong that these Dacians, actually within three, four generations, took over Latin language. That means that these people, Romanized Dacians, remain here as the island of the sea, even after the great migrations, influence surrounded by Slavic people and later on by Turks. Still, the influence of Romans was so strong that this Roman, Romanized language of Dacians survived until today with uh, almost with more than 20 million people, 20 million population, of course with many uh, Slavic uh, words from Ukrainian, maybe Slovak, probably maybe Bulgarian, uh, also many many words from uh, Turkish languages. But the point is that the language still is Romans, and uh, for Romanians it is very easy to learn. Uh, Spanish, Italian, French or Portuguese, they can actually understand it just like we can understand Polish or Czech or Croatian for Slovenian. Not of course everything, but it is pretty easy for them to learn. And that explains why Romanians are heading their migration uh, for work, for labor, the, uh, goes to these countries. How they got to the name and also to the flag and to these medieval uh, coats of arms is that Romanians became Eastern Orthodox Christians. Actually, I studied a lot about this. And it's kind of a small enigma, even for Romanians, that uh, how Eastern Orthodox Christianity came to them. There are possible two explanations, or three explanations. One is really logical, that it came from Byzantine Empire and Bulgaria. Uh, now there is a problem why it happened when these guys never use Cyrillic alphabet. The point is that they try to use it because some letters are in uh, Romanian language not present in other Roman languages. Nevertheless, uh, it became that since uh, 10th century AD, uh, Dacians and like this Romanized, Romanized people of Dacia, but also New Brandly established uh, uh, territories of Wallachia and Moldavia. These people started to become uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians uh, with all the things we have. Actually, they got some specific features, very different from Ukrainian or Russian or Southern Slavic part, but that's the point. The other part, Transylvania, said Mohradsko for us, became part of Kingdom of Hungary. And uh, yes, they still were these Dacians having this Eastern Orthodox Christianity, but the thing was that uh, many people in here were also Roman Catholic, but also later on Evangelicals or Calvinists, a lot of Jews in here, and also quite a mixed uh, ethnicity. So very different from, let's say, these Valachians, who were, like, I would say, ethnically not so diverse, but as all Kingdom of Hungary in Transylvania with Russians and Ukrainians in the north, with uh, Romanians uh, in central part, and also a lot of Germans settling after the colonizations, and also, of course, a lot of Magyars speaking Hungarians, Magyars at the, the borders and in the middle with Sikuls. Nevertheless, this was part uh, of uh, Romania until the 1918, 1918. So for centuries we had we shared the same history with them. Uh, what uh, I told you that there were also new territories that uh, gradually had to build up their power and create this feudal system. And there were two principalities of uh, Valachia, Valachsko, uh, south of uh, southern Carpathians and uh, north of the Danube River with Bukuresti in here. At the time, Targoviste was the first, uh, was the biggest city in here. And Moldova or Moldavia, uh, which is not only uh, Moldavia or Moldova as a country today, but also eastern part of Romania that also is called Multania or Moldavia and actually it's the same Moldavians speak the same language there are like slight differences and there are actually attempts to unify them of course Russians would not allow them and also many Romanians so the Kamal Moldavia is not really poor so it would be difficult so this is the reason why they share also the flag Moldova got also only the coat of arms of their country but also with a with a bull that's one of these this one the bull, bull's head in here. Now these two, what happened? Now we have Ottoman Empire invading these lands and of course Valachian Moldavians were trying to fight fiercely. Among them, 
It was a great legendary stories of Vlad Tepes, uh, of Vlad the Imperial. Vlad Tepes was the, the Duke of Valachia that was fighting Ottoman Turks in the 15th century. And uh, he was actually inspiration, despite really crazy, uh, for... Uh, Abraham Stoker uh, to give inspiration to history to his vampire character of the Dracula uh, novel. And if you want to see uh, the probably the closest to reality uh, movie, so the paradox is that I believe that the, the YouTube is not going to erase it for me, but there is a trailer only Dracula Untold is actually a story of how Dracula came from Vlad Tepes. And this is interesting because uh, this guy, you know, maybe from the Hobbit movie, yes, and the point is that these guys were actually fighting, this is Valachia and maybe Transylvania fighting against Ottoman Empire in the 14th century, so you'll see actually even Ottoman Turks who had really excellent costumes and the warfare depicted like in here, of course it's really dramatic because it's not based as a historical reality at all, but sometimes you know that uh, some uh, historical fiction is sometimes more accurate than uh, historic movies, you know, historical movies. So if you want to see something about Romanian history, watch watch this one, this part. This part was shot by Americans, dramatic and so on, so probably I would be really, really... Uh, Surprise my many friends if they see it. Uh, if uh, Danka is watching this, so hello. Uh, English teacher from Romania from Alcomenis project. Okay, what else? Uh, now, uh, despite of Vlad Tepes, the Impaler becoming Dracula in this uh, movie, sorry for the spoiler, uh, Valachians and Moldovans were defeated and they had to subject it to, they had to subject to the Ottoman uh, Sultans. They were sending the uh, boys to the Janissaries armies, uh, paying tribute and they had to participate on their military campaign. So for us, for example, for Slovaks, we met with Valachians, Moldavians very often as part of Ottoman troops or Crimean Tatar troops in here as their vassals. Of course, they didn't like it very much, but if they paid the tribute, they were not forced to uh, to change the Christianity. They only paid taxes, participated, they were like allies, but that was all. They could keep their uh, traditions. Among the guys, another one that is really famous is Michal de Bray, uh, also a character in Duro Červenak, Duro Červenak book uh, from Pozen. And when I was looking for some interesting, uh, interesting Romanian movies, because the kinematography can be really uh, new for us, is that also Romanians shot this movie, shot this movie in I believe 1970s or 80s about their battles of uh, how Valachia and Moldova defeated, actually defeated Ottoman Empire, Empire in this day. So huge battle scenes that Romanians were really proud of, and also you'll see uh, maybe not so technologically and uh, like a s historical sorting. Okay, I have bad internet connection. Uh, so sorry for it's like slow motion. But uh, that was kind of a kind of a story that was also part of the history. So you may be surprised with what is in here. And this is like 1595. So we have already we are already in early modern early modern period. So uh, Battle of Kaluga uh, Rani Kaluga Rani. So uh, let's move on. Okay, this is not the part uh, for me. This is the one. Okay, uh, so what else do we have in here? Uh, finally, when Turk, Ottoman Turks were being uh, was being weakened by many wars after Habsburgs and especially after the Crimean War, Valachia and Moldav Moldavia were actually uh, independent again, and they realized that well, no nothing actually divides them more than unites them, and they decided that after this war, despite Russians were defeated, they were accepted with support of France now uh, as as a Roman speaking country to create personal union of Valachia and Moldova in 1859. After uh, war, uh, another wars, you know, that uh, in which uh, uh, Austria-Hungary uh, already was defeated, so they approved also with creation of one person, not only personal union, but one country that started to be called the Principality of Romania. And now the language of Romania is actually the, the same example, the analogy with Belgians or with Spain. If you can't get the name for one, like, Iberian Peninsula, the lowlands of something, 
but not all of them. So they just look back to history, what were they? They actually were playing with the idea of Dacia, of Dacia, but as a name for the country, but I decided like maybe in the future we should unite also with Transylvania, and actually they will, they would, and uh, that's why they pick up this name like the land of Romans, Cidoslova Rimsko. Okay, so Romania is actually calling that they were descendants of Romans. Of course, with the flags in here, with the coats of arms of Valachia and Moldova uh, is in here today. There is also uh, Savar Castle, Sedmohradsko, Transylvania for us. Actually, Vlad Tepes, uh, if you didn't know, he actually managed to survive many wars, but he escaped to... Uh, Kingdom of Hungary to Transylvania, where he was imprisoned by Matthias Corvinus. Now, what happens? There were a couple of other wars, and this war of 1877-78 will be really crucial and dramatic and important for us. So, for that reason, independence of Romania was officially approved at the Congress of Berlin that I had mentioned uh, when we had this Russian history. So, for many Balkan countries, this Congress of uh, Berlin was really important and uh, really crucial because it uh, internationally proved the approved their existence okay uh what i have in here again you can't see the romanian flag but you know it in here from here and uh in 1881 with the support of france again they uh changed their the formal government from principality to the kingdom which was also like sometimes attempts with constitutional monarchy but most of uh, the time uh their kings were uh like regular kings with almost uh, unlimited power and of course it caused a lot of conflicts with uh, constitutional processes of Romanian people with the intellectuals in here so that's why Romania was actually like country changing a lot and uh, also their history is changing almost every two years and that's why for the first world war they will be at the beginning as a neutral then they would enter uh, the entente powers to support france which was not very successful because even they were they were occupied but after the war romanians were like uh, proclaiming independence again and even they managed not only to take transylvania but even to invade their like arch enemy not Turks, I mean, this time, not anymore, but uh, Hungary, Hungarians, and even invade Budapest. So that was interesting. From the last of the movies uh, to recommend, to recommend about Romanian uh, cinematography is uh, this Aferim, uh, which is actually comedy, uh, talking about uh, Romani family, or this gypsy family, and uh, how one of them is, is captured is captured by some guys and it's depicting Romanian society of the I believe 19th century it should be in the 19th century and it's really funny it's like famous movie from the film clubs so that was really really beautiful folklore actually I cannot play all the stuff because there are also some vulgar words but showing showing really in funny way like Romanian culture you should not mock it because it's so similar to maybe our movies of like this is like thousand years old B or uh, I mean many others so okay old songs okay that's all from Aferim uh, and about of course there the the culture let's move on let's move on to the next part Serbians Again, important country, but I can tell you that most of my lifetime, this I, I, this country was not independent, but it was central part of a bigger country, that was Yugoslavia for me. And uh, but for most of the history, they were independent, not independent. Again, they were occupied by some other nations, but their long history is similar to maybe uh, Croatian or Slovak and uh, the other Bulgarians too. Uh, Serbians are also Southern Slavs, they are not like Romanians or Greeks and they had their own kingdoms and tribal unions and so on and what to mention from medieval times Serbia managed to have uh, managed to have their own kingdom even Tsardom from which these uh, coat of arms come from with double-headed eagle obviously from Byzantine Empire uh, taken and also the Greek cross another inspiration and these four crowns of also Byzantine cross uh, Serbs were using this coat of arms uh, in especially 14th century uh, during the Tsar or the King Stepan Dushan 
uh, after his actually expansion, because Serbia was really huge, really big at those times, including all the Bosnia and Herzegovina, going almost to Greece, to Byzantine Empire. So that was actually defeated and ended up with the Battle of Kosovo Pole in 1389. If you remember uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire topic, that was one of the battles that may allow Turks to invade those lands and I pick up, picked up these kings and generals. Uh, uh, YouTube channel for you, uh, which is description this video was by the great of uh, this one. Okay, we don't want to do any sponsorship in here. So from. this is the picture of how this Battle of Kosovo Apollo took part, and after which uh, Ottomans defeated them. For this, for this, uh, okay, maybe I should I should also uh, put this uh, volume down. But my point is uh, to show you the map of this uh, 14th century. 14th century Serbian Empire, look at this, it's really huge. Serbia today is this one, this part, and at the time even including Montenegro and uh, Macedonia and so on. Uh, what happened? The Serbians were under attacks of Ottoman Turks, and of course there are some changes. And in this Battle of Kosovo Pola, when they were invaded by Ottoman Turks, uh, Serbians look uh, for all the allies around, also from their original like empire. That was only during the times of Stepan Dusan and other kings. Actually, their kings were had interesting name from Greek that you may know from Oriental. Asian ancient history, which is called despots, despota. So even to, even later on, Serbian dukes and princes were using calling this one. So we had some computer game like marching armies for us, for me. Uh, I want to stress that this battle, uh, Lazar Harbelenanovic and various uh, leaders in here having cavalry, medieval armies, not only had Serbian troops but also help of Montenegrins, Chernohorci, of Croatians. Of Bosniaks and even of Albanians at the time, still uh, Christians in here, actually didn't help them because uh, this uh, Ottoman army had these mass cannons in here that actually destroyed this medieval cavalry together with uh, infantry shooters, janissaries. Uh, but these cannons actually destroyed all these all these armies. So uh, this Battle of Kosovo Pola ended with terrible defeat of. Uh, of these allied forces of Serbia, uh, allowing them, I can close also this battle of uh, the brave. And what happened in here that after the battle, for uh, which uh, Serbians really uh, remembered, was that uh, actually the, the, the Sultan was assassinated by one of the Serbian uh, Serbian uh, uh, leaders, uh, nob nobleman. One was called Miloš Obilić who actually gave up pretending he's going to accept Islam uh, and he was taken to Sultan at one of the high-ranked nobility but he had a hidden dagger and he stabbed her and he killed, assassinated uh, Sultan Murat. Uh, it didn't help despite Miloš Obilić became a legendary hero and actually said kind of a, how to say, attitude of Balkans that is different from us that they are going to war to fight any time and they've got nothing to lose. This mentality is very different. In the Second World War, First World War, any time, that would be really different even these days. So, uh, as I told you, the first actually fire cannon artillery battle, a big one apart from the Hundred Years' War, caused that Serbia was occupied by Turks until the 19th century. What is interesting that uh, only tiny Montenegro defended its independence. Again, you cannot see the picture, but this is later on in the 19th century. Uh, so let's skip it because Serbians uh, were paying taxes and they were not forced to accept, uh, accept uh, Islam, religion, Muslim religion. Uh, as I said, the tiny Montenegro keep their independence. That was small principality or duchy of Duklia and the principality of Zeta. And these were deep in the mountains of Durmitor, which are like 2500 meters altitude, where still I would say like clan tribal system of ancient Slavic people were living with a blood feud like from old Illyrian Greek times. So even when Turkish troops came there, they were actually easily defeated in these narrow canyons of River Tara and so on. And even when, uh, if officially Turks proclaimed in their territory, when they came to pick up the taxes, Montenegrins actually fought them back. So this is interesting that these uh, small uh, Montenegrin uh, principalities had support of Republic of Venice together with the uh, 
with the, the Republic of Kotor, part of, part of uh, their territories actually kept their independence. So what is interesting, as you see Montenegro and these French maps still were part of independent ones, so not like the others. Okay, what happened? What happened next? So we are coming to the beginning of 19th century. Again, Serbians among the first started to fight, and they used this period of... Um, coalition wars of Napoleonic wars and that was first Serbian uprising when they enjoyed a short period of independence in 1804. Uh, then in 1812 they were, uh, they were occupied by Turks again but Serbia at least was given some autonomy. Nevertheless uprisings uh, was still there and at least when they were occupied by Ottoman Turks they start to resist in cultural like resistance this was similar to Slovakia and Slovaks also found inspiration in Serbia with the establishment of big cultural organization called Matica Srpska you know in Slovakia Matica Slovenska is another like like big publishing house with uh, libraries and uh, cultural institutions supporting them with buildings and money and so on so it was kind of like interesting for our our period. Actually, the independence of uh, of course there are many uprisings around that you see also Russian flag introduced again in here, just like in Slovakia. We'll learn about this again. And uh, finally, Serbia was given independence after again this Russian-Turkish War of 1878. See, again, this war was very, very important. Okay, again, another links for the videos that I found interesting for you is uh, this, if I had a good internet connection, it's history of Serbia for every year. You know this very well. You know this very well. I'm not going to enlarge it. So uh, I'm pretty sure it will be pretty enough for you with some music around and... You see, already 8th century with the flags of double cross, again, influenced from uh, 8th century. I'm not sure whether all the uh, all the kings uh, and all the dukes and princes, Vladikas, rulers, uh, were like real or not. But the point is that you have the Southern Slavic Serbian tribes in here. And of course, when we move to Verais, guys, and 19th century depictions, the point is that how they move to other parts, including Bosnia, Herzegovina, Dalmatia, Sometimes even more a different color of the Byzantine Empire that they were occupied as maybe one of the province of them So when we move on, let's say to other part uh, of their history Which is already Stepan, Stefan Urosh is one of great kings and They're going to tell you their history. That would be really big stuff big deal. Okay, I, I believe I think that would be already Stefan Stepan Urosh the fifth and see that the empire was really big, big one. I'll say, okay, uh, Lazar Hrabeljanovic is was the one defeated at Battle of Kosovo, Poles, so soon we are changed, we are, uh, will be changed to Ottoman Empire. Of course, if there is some other dukes, you're all the vassals of Ottoman Empire, that's why. This was period of ceased existence, and if we had some attempts, again, we got this this 19th century flag already Russia we turned out and they had already uh, like uh, the representatives of the dukes and since now there will be a kingdom so now Obrenovich the Obrenovich the kingdom is already here very small when you compare it to Austria Hungary and it will be really really important then what is going to change soon that uh, during the first world war soon to come soon to come uh, there will be at war uh, for a while occupied by austria hungary right now but again after the second world war unification with croatia slovenia bosnia herzegovina macedonia montenegro creating the kingdom of yugoslavia since 1929 this king wanted to rule as a part of uh, of uh, sorry sorry that was really fast but i wanted to show you one part again that the last king of Yugoslavia wanted to be part of Adolf Hitler and Mussolini's coalition pact against Cominterna. But what happened? Very quickly, there was a prizing against him, which caused that uh, Yugoslavia proclaimed war against these Axis powers, uh, which caused that Serbia was uh, occupied by uh, not only Germans and Italians, but Bulgarians, Magyars, Romanians too, and... Uh, but it didn't help, but be because from their history, their resistance since times of medieval times, Turkish wars, and uh, all these periods, Serbians have this courage to fight. And together with Croatians, they started the big partisan warfare in which actually southern parts of Serbia were not occupied at all, or only the cities. And huge partisan warfare, not only led by communists, but also by nationalists and democratic movement, caused that Serbia very quickly was restored again. 
uh, and actually overruled by communists later on and especially known by this guy but soon to come uh, Josip Broz Tito who was, who was actually the actually the communist ruler, uh, the socialist ruler of socialist Yugoslavia, again resisting to Soviet Union. So in this year, 1968, for example, criticizing intervention to Czechoslovakia. And when he died in 1981, all these guys were Serbians, and that's why Croatians in here uh, started to, to resist, and uh, because Serbians turned to nationalism again until the Sloboda Milosevic just started terrible civil war in which, as you see, Yugoslavia is falling apart, and uh, eventually changing to only flag with this flag of Union of Serbia and Montenegro, but again, in the Montenegro seizing independence, then Kosovo proclaiming independence not accepted by all, including Slovakia and the Serbia until today. You see, we got 19th century, but uh, on that way, I'm using this moment to, to show you all these, all these parts. Let's come to Bulgarians. Bulgarians, again, country you know well, uh, Southern Slavic peoples, together with Montenegrin, is probably the least understandable for us. Uh, with like very different, uh, different lexicology, especially different words. Uh, they were actually given name after nomadic Bulgars, similar to Magyars, who established this Tsardom or Canadian and then Tsardom of Bulgaria. Actually, that's why, uh, despite these Bulgars were assimilated by Southern Slavic people, so the head of the state of this kingdom was Tsar and. Of course, in many famous wars against Byzantines, you know that it was another battle of Nicopol, 1396, in which our king, Sigismund Luxembourg, failed to uh, protect Bulgaria from Ottoman occupation. And again, Bulgarians, because they're so close to Ottoman territories, they really had no chance to... Uh, to fight it, to keep on fighting. Sorry, I forgot to check uh, the time. Okay, about 20 minutes. So before that, I just go back to this moment and uh only to check the time uh now here in uh bulgarians uh, started to resist pretty late uh pretty late because they were under big like huge control not huge but strict control of ottoman turks so the earliest uprising a big one that was already successful was so-called april uprising of 1876 during this Russian-Turkish war. And that was actually a major reason, major pretense for Russians to invade Ottoman, anti uh, Ottoman territories and actually to help Bulgarians to proclaim their independence. So you cannot be surprised again when this country is Southern Slavic, Eastern Orthodox religion is as great allies with Russians. So now uh, Russians uh, forced Ottomans to sign up this piece of San Stefano in which so-called Great Bulgaria was planned. And uh, they also introduced a flag as a tribute to Russians with not only their coat of arms with a golden lion, but Russian flag, but changed this blue color into green. But what is the thing that uh, immediately, when also Bulgaria was too big and Ottoman Empire too weakened, now there was this Congress of Berlin in which Bulgaria uh, was promised independence in case they would give up some of the territories of Greater Bulgaria, but their independence will be protected by also Western powers or these conservative powers. So despite Bulgarians were fighting like in the past of Shipka Pass, that was famous battle during their war of independence, uh, it was decided that in 1878, Bulgaria was given actually much smaller, like only maybe one half of the territories, you cannot see it, only this small one, uh, but they lost Macedonia, access to DCs, much smaller, definitely much smaller. And uh, but uh, in 1885, the independence of Bulgaria was confirmed by all the states of Europe. Of course, in much smaller territory, but even Tsar of Bulgaria was the, the, uh, the this picked up, yeah, that's sorry for that, picked up from uh, another uh, Saxon Gotha Coburg family from Sveti Anton, again, famous for us, for uh, Banska Stiavnica Ferdinand the I Coburg, who was actually the last owner of this mansion near our town, and he, after the fall of Bulgaria in the, uh, after the First World War, he actually went to exile here to Czechoslovakia already. So here in the picture, but also as a guy who was more more concern turned to conservative regimes of uh, 
Germany and Austria-Hungary logically because he was from here so Bulgarians were fighting not only first but also in the Second World War on the side of Nazi Germany despite always having support from Russia or then like the Soviet Union that was really big changes in here what remained from Bulgaria until today is our, our territories after the Second World War with also experience of communist rule in here uh, also they're a member of European Union Slavic people with beautiful beaches there but uh, one of the like the the poorest countries of European Union still like trying to get here. Their Bulgarians like you don't have like such great opportunities to go abroad today like we have. What else? Just like Slovakia, Serbia, even today after strong influence of Russia all the time, and that's why let's say only the statistics of their vaccination against COVID is similar to Slovakia, Latvia, or Serbia, and these Brazilians to here. Let's come to the last country that is today independent, uh, despite with very dramatic history, and many people claim that it maybe doesn't even exist. This Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina was part of uh, various South and Slavic uh, principalities and experiencing only short period of independence in the 15th century and that was a big Slavic kingdom of the rule of this guy Tvrtko the first yeah for us for Slav very funny name just like they may love on very many of our words you know that and that was he was using this uh, coat of arms with lily flowers typical for this like late gothic period with a helmet and this was also inspiration for a Bosnian flag in early 1990s. Nevertheless, uh, Bosniaks in the mountains of Dinars, of the Dinare mountains, they were fighting fiercely against by against the Turks, and that's why Turks moved, just like in the case of Albania, to something that they, when these guys, Bosniaks, refused to pay taxes. So Turks came with, uh, like, uh, killing out people, killing out the, the, uh, the villagers, until the, the survivors didn't accept Islam. Now they could be sure they would be more willing to uh, accept the rule of the Sultan and the governors of, uh, of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So this Islamization caused this situation and once this kingdom having not only part of Serbia, Bosnia, but also a large part of Croatia and Ugarska, as you see, it's like part of almost to Zagreb, so this kingdom now will be divided in ethnically in not so much because the language started to be different maybe in the 20 21st century due to the fact that croatians are trying to accept many words from lexicology not of Serbia, but of different, actually make up new words just to make it different from Serbian. What was the difference also among these Muslims or Catholics, Orthodox, is actually the religion. So also even today the country is approximately one third of Orthodox Serbians along the borders, but also in this part between uh, Croatian borders, one third of Catholic Croatians, especially in this Dalmatian part and Central part, and one third of Muslims, that is this blue color today. And for that reason, uh, Bosnia was also divided, as you can see, with all these three nationalities in here, uh, according to actually religion. But uh, I can tell you that I was listening to all three languages. Uh, of course, I'm, I can't speak their language, but also my friends, they're studying what used to be called Serbo-Croatian. Uh, found that uh, actually it was especially for Bosnia and Herzegovina, really difficult. And differences between Czech and Slovak were much smaller are much bigger than between Serbian and Croatian, let's say, in 1980s. So this is actually a bit sad that the religion made these uh, people fighting, but we know from history, even like from the presence, Ukrainians and Russians fighting in here caused that this is a different stuff. Bosnia and Herzegovina, due to the fact they didn't have their history, their ethnicity, that was distinct from the others. For that reason, the Congress of Berlin didn't decide, the, refused to proclaim independent Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, but they accepted that there are Muslim population in here and they also accepted that Serbians lost the contact, uh, actually like interrupted the contact or connection, geographical connection between Ottomans and Bosniaks. For that reason, they appointed that Bosnia-Herzegovina will still be part of Ottoman Empire, but they would be military protector. It will be protectorate of Austria-Hungary because there are their borders around. So uh, they will be actually the guarantor of the guarantee of peace and peaceful solution among all these uh, 
nationalities in here. So for that reason, as you see Le Petit Journal, famous picture magazine in France showing Austria-Hungary, Franz Josef I, uh, Tsar um, Nicholas II, and uh, also the Ottoman Empire, how they are taking part of the left from Bulgaria and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, still, between these years, it was just protectorate uh, and not official one. But in 1907, Austria-Hungary, with actually restoring of the nationalism and imperialism, this important thing, because idea of having great empire was restored. And when Germans, French, and I don't know, Italians and British are building the empires, why not Austria-Hungarians? But they didn't have access to uh, they had access to Mediterranean Sea, but no chance to get in colonies in Oriental world or like in the third world. So that's why they turned into Balkans and they started with expansion and here with annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Annexation is military occupation with no resistance. Not only because people like refuse it, that would be Anschluss, for example, like without resistance, but they had no military power to fight. So annexation is military occupation without any fighting around. That was actually pretense for the world war. Do you know why? Because for many Bosnians, like in this group, these guys uh, started to fight as partisans, especially in Macedonia, and also proclaiming that some other countries should fight against only Ottomans, but also against the kings who accepted to have these various borders in here. And among them, from these guys, even like Serbian nationalists, compared to young Italy, the young Turks, but also young Serbia. And also there was a movement called Young Bosna, and from here, these young Bosnians, now they were recruiters, some of the people, some of the members of these uh, of uh, the the terrorist organization called like uh, we call it the Black Hand. Despite they didn't have black hand, but you know that was not colored with a hand, but a pirate flag and a poison flag and a hand grenade. Uh, that I tried to read it. I believe I can remember something. Uh, I think that it means like union or a death. Uh, unification of that. And that was a case from which uh, Gavrilo Princip, the mother of the assassin of uh, Franz Ferdinand d'Este, came to be. Okay, we have the Balkan Wars in here, so very quickly let's move on. Again, I'm going to check the, uh, check the time. And here, so I got only 10 minutes, which is perfect because it means I can manage to uh, come to the end for this. Um, uh, the lesson and you still have it at the test or for that don't forget to check the my questions from before the lesson now the balkan wars was actually the result of all these like dramatic changes of borders in the balkans uh and positions so this is the map showing the position just before them with ottoman empire still having their territories especially macedonia was like apple of uh of uh, the argument uh, who to fight. Bulgarians claim Macedonians were Bulgarians, Serbians and Macedonians were Serbians. Uh, Ottomans claiming that Macedonians, there are many uh, Muslim Albanians and Muslim uh, Turks and whatever. Of course, Greeks claim Macedonia as ancient kingdom of Greece. Actually, these South Slavic territories promise of Northern Macedonia changed their name only like the previous year to make difference for Southern Macedonia, which is actually the province of Greece, which is the, the birthplace of uh, Alexander of Macedon. The truth is that Macedonians themselves were actually uh, very proud of Alexander of Macedonia, despite they, did, they didn't have anything with them. The, actually, another part is that many people, of course, got origin from Greeks, not from Slavic people. But this is the other part. So now we have territorial aspirations of new Balkan states against weakening Ottoman Empire especially this Macedonia. For the Turks, now we have nationalist movement of young Turks trying to also restore um, Turkey, like make Turkey or Ottoman Empire great again, maybe a republic and towards each other, even Bulgarians, Serbians, Romanians, Bulgarians, and everybody else against Austro-Hungarians in here. The first Balkan War in 1912 started with a so-called the Balkan League creating of Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria, and Greece in the south that invaded these Ottoman territories and divided. And now dividing Macedonia caused actually terrible 
argument among them and uh, actually making angry about Bulgarians is most of this because what matters, the matter was that who comes to Skopje, the capital of Macedonia first and they were Bulgarians with their flags. But as you see Verai's uniform standing against Ottoman Empire is from Le Petit Journal, again you cannot see another Verai's pictures. For example, Greece finally came to march to uh, Thessaloniki in here, Turks surrendering and so on. But the point is that during this uh, war there was another big uprising in one of the vilayets of Ottoman Empire in Albania. This probably lyric speaking, and Albanians, just like Bal uh, just like Bosniaks, Brazilian took against Ottoman rule in the 15th century under the leadership of the greatest hero. Uh, uh, Skanderbeg uh, were forced to accept Islam and actually this is the only exception in Europe that all country turned to Islam and Albanians are Muslims today. Actually I would call them secular Muslims because also their like, attitude is very different and also years of communist rule just like in us cause that many people are not like real believers or they are not fulfilling the believers. So that's the point, the situation in here and what Turks lost was like dramatic and big big territories that Greeks and Bulgarians said and also Serbians. Now let's come to the second Balkan war because Bulgaria this time was dissatisfied with small acquisitions because not Bulgarians but Serbians actually took Macedonia over. So this map is depicting the situation in here. Uh, so for that reason Bulgarians prepare to attack their former allies of Serbia and Greece, All, not only in conquest of Macedonia, but also in conquest of not only uh, this uh, South Thrace, but also this part of Macedonia and uh, Chalkidiki, perhaps. Because they believe, and as there were many Macedonian, Slavic people living, many Turks and many Bulgars, so there was, was not like real, real Greek territories, as you see according to this ethno-linguistic map. But now, and this war again, there we have some Bulgarian troops in here of Ferdinand Coburg, but now uh, all the former uh, allies of Bulgaria supported their former allies of Serbia and Greece, and now Montenegro, but now also Romania invading the territory of Dobruja, and even Ottoman Empire, within like half year, they helped Greeks and Serbians with invading Bulgarian troops actually marching to, uh, to Istanbul. So actually there were two, the aspirations of Bulgarians were too big and they failed to restore their Tsardom of medieval times. So now now Bulgaria was defeated in 1913, so which is very important present that after the war, uh, after this war, Serbia still having these Macedonia Bulgarians feeling anger and feel of revenge, the revanchism against Serbians and Greeks, and that was actually a logical thing that Bulgarians would use triple alliance, Austria-Hungarian Empire and Germany, not only of their king, the Tsar, Balaferna Koburg, but also because of this defeat. Now, uh, the ethnic and religious hostility and also the strategic positions and also the interest of various powers in the Balkans made uh, it a so-called the gunpowder barrel of Europe. Uh, so that's why also the Balkan wars were kind of prelude to the First World War, which started in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia Herzegovina, where Franz Ferdinand d'Este would be uh, assassinated by uh, probably Serbian or Bosniak uh, terrorist organization and with Gavrilo Princip uh, and also the um, the result one of the symbols is that I found that this second Balkan war was the first war in which military uh, first uh, invention uh, great invention airplanes that only were fly flying for 14 years so 15 years so they were used as as uh, killing weapons like you see they were dropping these uh, bombs from from the altitude in here in the first Balkan war that's all from the 19th century huge presentation Les and gals for b and for c um we are going to write a test uh this week uh after the after the classes you already know whether after thursday or friday lessons uh, it will be really a massacre, really, really difficult, so please study hard and don't be surprised with very bad marks, but uh, I need to show you what is the actual uh, knowledge you need to know. Uh, so you can discuss and you can develop and you can compare, make analogies in here. Not only in the Balkans to understand all the things that are in here, actually we, Slovaks and Czechs and these countries are few of one that we support, we are friends with all of them in here and we can understand them probably. But also 
absolutely terrible things that the First World War comes with a gunpowder of Balkan troubles that all the kings and emperors are trying to keep, but also inventions of Nikola Tesla in here, but also the architecture, how the, uh, the, the people and the world has changed, uh, had changed before the First World War. So that's all from me, guys. Let's next lesson, we are moving to, we are moving to Slovak National uh, Awakening Movement, Slovenske Narodne Obrodenie in Slovak, and we will see uh, what comes after the uh, Christmas holidays. So enjoy it and have fun, stay safe, and we'll see, we'll see uh, what will be the next. So bye-bye, that's all from me.